Well, coming up on today's show, Tesla's software version 9 is rolled out, Polestar starts assembling prototypes, and 530 more charges for Florida. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are in the world. Hello and welcome to EV News Daily. It's Saturday the 6th of October 2018. It's Martin Lee here, and I've been through every EV story today, so you don't have to. Well, thank you to myev.com for helping make the show. You know, they've built the world's first marketplace, specifically all about buying, selling and learning about electric vehicles. And one of their new articles this week, all about learning about EVs, well, we'll get to that in a little while. Thank you to not one, but two new patrons of this podcast. Hello to David Sloan and Steve Clark, the latest to become producers of this here podcast and bring you the news. Well, this week, Tesla owners across North America are waking up to a car that is smarter, safer and more intuitive than ever before. Not my words, the words of Tesla in their new press release that's just gone live on their website. And I'll put a link to that website page on the official Tesla site in the show notes. They say our most substantial update yet is software version 9, introducing a refined and simplified user interface, along with entirely new features for the Model S, the X and the 3 and your mobile app. To receive version 9 as quickly as possible, connect your car to Wi-Fi, and here's an overview of what you'll get. First of all, the Tesla mobile app has been updated. Uh, Using the app, you can now initiate the vehicle software updates remotely without having to be inside your car. You can use your phone to send a destination to the car's nav system, for instance. Just hit the share button on your favorite map app. There's a new dash cam that's been probably the most widely reported of all the features on the S, the X, and the 3. If you've got hardware 2.5 or newer, so that was introduced about a year ago, August 2017, uh, you can record and store video captured from the forward-facing camera. And the quality I've seen so far looks good, not great, but good. And more cameras, they say, maybe even the rear-facing one could be added. New apps and an app launcher, again, for the S, the X, and the 3, a new application launcher, brings it all together in one place. Your calendar, your energy, your web browser, the rear-view camera, uh, the phone, the charging apps. And three new apps, if you've got a Model 3, uh, three new apps, web browsing, calendar, and uh, the ability to monitor energy consumption in real time or view the projected energy for an upcoming trip. It really is an impressive update they've done. One thing that people are very excited about, which isn't here yet, is Navigate on Autopilot. That's now been announced as a coming soon option with version 9. Uh, They're expanding the suite of Autopilot features. They say future updates will enable nav on autopilot. There's a full 360 view now, all eight external cameras from the full self-driving hardware in every SX and 3 are now active, enabling better situational awareness on the road. There's a full 360-degree visualisation of the surrounding vehicles. If it's a bike, it's a bike on the screen. If it's a truck, it's a truck on the screen. Um, Blind spot monitoring, which was previously relied solely on the ultrasonic sensors of the Teslas, now uses the side and the rear-facing cameras to detect vehicles and displays them on screen. Now, the 360-degree visualisation also shows vehicles in adjacent lanes, even when they're behind or far ahead of the car you're driving. And multiple lanes to each side of your car are now visible. Very impressive update that also includes some enhanced navigation routing, obstacle aware acceleration. So that is, you know, you read an article occasionally of of a 90 year old who's driving their car through a brick wall. Uh, Basically, it's that. So you can turn this feature on and if there's something in front of your car and you floor it, and uh, for whatever reason, you accidentally hit you hit the accelerator or it's a mistake or whatever. But if your car senses that it shouldn't be going forwards, then it won't do. Very clever. And some new fun and games in there as well. If you have a Tesla, and I, I imagine you are furiously waiting, uh, if you haven't got it yet for your version 9, to have a little play with that. If you do, let me know your impressions. I've seen tons on Twitter, but as part of this community, as part of one of the fellow listeners of the podcast, uh, I always appreciate when you put it in your own words because it hasn't got the spin that some people put on Twitter, you know. And so I like to hear it in your words. If you do drive one, you've got version 9, let me know what it's like. Well, electric vehicles will always be more costly than fuel burners. Uh, Again, not my words. They are the words of a senior BMW executive. And and to quote him, no, no, no. (laughs) Great quote. That's it. End quote. No, no, no. Uh, Klaus Frolich's reply when asked if if EVs will ever equal the price 
of an equivalent fossil. Never, he said. That's the quote. Never, according to news.com.au in Australia. I thought I was reading a, a spoof article to begin with, or like, you know, like The Onion or something. And then you think, well, this, you can't be someone at the top of BMW saying something as ridiculous as EVs will never be as cheap as fossil cars. But I think this is real. He says this, and I quote, batteries are the problem. Uh, the 58-year-old BMW board member, Klaus Frolich, is in charge of the development of their cars, lithium-ion cells that can store the standard one kilowatt hour unit of electrical energy, uh, he says, costs 170 to $250. That's 100 to 150 euros. It's very simple, said Frolich in EVs. With 90 to 100 kilowatt battery packs, you're looking at 17000 to $25,000. He says you can produce whole cars only with the cost of the battery. Yes, you can produce a car for £17,000. Uh, $17,000. You can. But they won't be great cars, they will they? They won't be nice executive BMWs. And also, where's he getting that price from? Because we heard only a few weeks ago at the shareholder meeting with Elon saying that Tesla, and they think that their battery tech is the best in the world, but they, they would say that. But you must think that even though Tesla and Panasonic are pretty confident that they're, they've they been working on this for a long time now, okay, they've been keeping them awake at night for years, you would think that there are other companies in the world whose technology is up there as well, if I'm being re realistic. And so when he said that by the end of the year, cell cost is going to be down to a $100 per, ki per uh, kilowatt hour, and therefore... That's about $10,000 for a 100 kilowatt hour pack when you can bring the pack level cost down. He said the pack level cost, which includes, of course, all the ancillaries and electronics, that'll be, he said, hopefully by 2020. And, he, and then he, he sort of referenced Elon time and said, no, no, I am being, you know, realistic with this. 2020, $100 at pack level. And so that's what Tesla is saying. I don't think that they are 20 years ahead of everybody on battery technology. I think they must be ahead in some areas. So why are BMW saying that it costs twice as much as that and that batteries will never come down in price and that EVs will always be more expensive than fossil cars? Look, I'll put a link to the article in the in the show notes. Read it for yourself. It was just really amusing for me to read that. It was just a, a strange thing to say. Never, never, never. Or no, no, no. That was the quote. There will never. EVs will never be cost parity with fossils. Wow. Okay, moving on to Volkswagen, a company that does have big, big plans for EVs. Inside EVs has the rundown on VW's MEB platform, which is going to be in use by the look of it until probably heading towards 2030. I mentioned yesterday on the podcast about, you know, these long lead times and... and 10 and 12 years is not a massively long time when you're making cars. Uh, the MEB platform is going to enable VW Group to produce electric cars of various sizes and classes. Of course, they've got lots of brands underneath the VW Group name to uh, have EVs made for. Battery capacities on this new platform, the MEB, can be uh, up to more than 100, actually, more than 100 kilowatt hours, 111 in the concept cars. Batteries are liquid-cooled and heated for the life of the car, so that's going to help the battery deg. We see those Tesla uh, stats where some of those Teslas that have done hundreds of thousands of miles are still in fine, fine shape. Uh, the range on the MEB platform is from 200 to 340 miles. So that's up to 550 kilometers, measuring by the new WLTP test cycle. Rear-wheel drive or dual-motor all-wheel drive, fast charging up to 125 kilowatts, and onboard charging at 11 kilowatts AC with the option of wireless charging. Volkswagen also plans to produce wall boxes at 22 kilowatts DC uh, charging capacity with bidirectional as well. So getting into V2G and Vita Home, uh, allowing energy to be supplied back to the grid. At night, electric cars connected to the VW bidirectional wall boxes can serve as storage batteries for surplus capacity. Uh, now, VW, interesting, are stepping into the debate about power grids. And they say that even with the anticipated increase in the number of registered EVs, the available grid is sufficient. Take Germany as an example. One million electric vehicles would consume approximately 2.4 terawatt hours of power per year. Energy, annual energy consumption in Germany is 517 terawatt hours per year. So the energy consumption would rise by 0.5%. Don't believe those articles you read in some of those newspapers that say we won't be able to boil the kettle when everyone plugs their car in. 
Well, testing EVs on UK's roads is one thing when you want to try and charge. That's another recently been a bit of a controversial topic. Richard Ingram is well worth following on Twitter, favourite motoring journalist of mine. And in Auto Express, he's been taking a look at the uh, UK charging via the Hyundai Kona on a bit of a road trip. Now, it was a challenge set by Hyundai a few weeks ago, and some writers who all drove the Konas overnight for 12 hours to see who would win, who would get the furthest. Unfortunately, Ecotricity, which have the contract that all the main motorways, the main roads here in the UK, they came in for some really bad publicity in this Auto Express article. He says this, and I quote, However, after five minutes of charging, our phone was suggesting no power had been delivered at all, while the charge time was falling. No energy was being transferred. Worried that we were wasting time as our car refused to charge, we hurriedly headed outside to find our fate. Our fears were realised when a glance at the plug socket showed the charge light had gone out. Whilst we'd wasted only 10 minutes with no on-screen explanation, we had no idea if it was our wrongdoing, the cars, or a faulty charge point. Determined to give it another go, we opened the app and resubmitted our card details. Again, the process appeared to work before dropping out three minutes later. We switched to the other stand available only for the same problem to occur. Feeling desperate with only a few miles of range added, we had no choice but to head south for the next service station, end quote. Now, this is a problem which I believe, I'm no expert on this, but I believe Ecotricity are fixing, but it's enormously bad publicity when uh, certain cars won't charge on your DC fast chargers for any charging network in any country around the world uh, for customers to be going, um, they don't work without cars? Uh, yes, okay, we'll, um, we'll have a look at that. So I believe a fix is being rolled out, but some of the frustrations continue because as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no log of which, and they've got loads of chargers, which chargers have had the fix applied and which haven't. So you're still worried about turning up to the chargers and thinking, is this one of the ones that's had the patch? Is it not? Am I going to charge? Am I going to be stranded? Am I going to be on the back of a lorry getting towed? Uh, if you can add any details to that, then email me. The email address, by the way, I like to mention this occasionally, is hello at evnewsdaily.com. Well, Polestar has started assembling a, um, a verification prototypes, they're called, of its upcoming plug-in hybrid, uh, the Polestar 1, as it prepares to produce customer cars next year. According to TechCrunch, verification prototypes of the Polestar 1 are being built by hand in the first stage of production. Vehicles are being crashed and and driven through all kinds of weather and all kinds of road conditions. Uh, the kind of tests that are going to help the engineers uh, really fine-tune the car. The company plans to build 34 of these prototypes, and then uh, that'll be done in Gothenburg in Sweden. Then they'll move the production line to Germany, where the cars will actually... Uh, sorry, China, where the cars will actually be made. Polestar will pay particular attention, they say, of how the carbon fibre body holds up under testing. I'll put a link to that TechCrunch article in the show notes. Now, what does it cost to own an EV? Well, my friends at myev.com, who you hear me talk about on the podcast, have been adding some new articles to their learning and researching sections of the website uh, to make better choices when you're buying or selling. How much does it cost to own an EV? A great new article. Uh, they cover things like EV incentives, maintenance costs, resale values, and used EV costs. Check it out. Uh, link in the show notes. Well, two more stories today, and zero-emission-capable taxis can actually halve a driver's exposure to toxic exhaust pollutants, according to new research done here in the UK. Excuse me. Uh, featuring in Fleet News today, it found the drivers of diesel taxis are exposed to pollution levels 1.8 times higher than those driving the new electric taxi. Uh, initial analysis found that while cab drivers face the same level of exposure to poor air quality as other commercial vehicle drivers and experience double the exposure at work compared to when they're not driving their cabs, the choice of vehicle made a big difference. Average exposure to nitrogen dioxide and black carbon was 1.8 times higher for drivers of the old cabs uh, than those who drive the new ones. That's a lot to do with the seals in terms of the air quality that gets in to the cab. Sadly, even the uh, the new electric cabs don't have something like a uh, bioweapon defence mode, but I guess you have to spend more than 100000 on a Tesla uh, to uh, to get that. Maybe not that much. I haven't I haven't looked at the design studio in a little while, so I'm not sure how cheap you can get bioweapon defense mode. But if you want that, that, that kind of carbon-activated filter and those things that really keep all the nasties out of the cabin of a Tesla, that doesn't come cheap. 
Well, finally, Duke Energy is installing up to uh, 530 electric vehicle charging stations across Florida to promote the benefits of clean electric transportation, according to Transportation News today. Uh, The charging stations are going to be in places like uh, public use, multi-unit dwellings, workplaces and locations with broad public access. The sites are being picked through an application process uh, with 10% installed in income-qualified communities. This is a fantastic thing. These are some of the places that I'm most passionate about finding solutions for apartment people, uh, dwellers, people who don't have off-street parking, people who can't charge where they live. So many people just flat out say an EV is not for me. And it could be, it could work if we can get the infrastructure there. So have a look at that article in the show notes if you're interested. If not, then why not take part in this week's question of the week? You've got one more day to answer it. We always set a new question and answer the current one on a Sunday. And thanks to myev.com, they've set this week's question of the week, which is this, plug-in hybrid or pure EV? What do you reckon? Simple question. Uh, What did you buy? What would you buy? What's your situation? Uh, I can see arguments for both. Plug-in hybrid or pure EV? Answer in the Facebook comments, the YouTube comments, the email, or the website itself has a feedback form, uh, which seems to be pretty popular these days. The website's evnewsdaily.com. There's 91. We added two more. Boom! 91 patrons of this podcast. You know, that is nine away from a landmark. Uh, And actually, if you go online and... um a lot of patrons kind of hide their monthly amount, which I find is weird and a bit secretive. Um, I kind of don't like that. So, of course, I put on there so you can see where all the money uh, that people fund this podcast with or how much of it and where it goes as well to making the podcast or the hosting fees, advertising it in places so that we spread the word as well. I've been doing some Facebook advertising recently, and I've noticed that the downloads have been going up a little bit on that as well. So all the money that comes in goes out, and it all is ring-fenced on the podcast, by the way, in case you were ever wondering. Uh, if you want to have a look at patreon.com slash evnewsdaily, it's, it's uh, all the money that comes in goes out specifically to do with this podcast. In fact, a bit more guest chip done by, by me as well still, but I'm interested in kind of how to advertise it on Twitter, on Facebook, on all those kind of places. So we'll see how we get on. We can spread the word and make it bigger. There's 256 episodes of the podcast in all the usual places that you get podcasts. And if you'd like to find us on the socials, like I say, Facebook, there's LinkedIn as well, and Twitter, search EV News Daily. Have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you tomorrow.